Okay, are we live? All right. Well, I think we're live. We're Come live. Yay. Yay. I think it's all Yay. happening. Yay. Hello. <laughs> Thank Hi, you, everybody, everybody, for your patience. <laughs> so, uh, how is everybody today? I hope you are doing well. We are joining you from all over the United States today. Um, and so no matter where you are at in the world, a big, uh, lots of love from everybody here at Llewellyn. And thank you for joining us in this really, I'm sure going, it's going to be a really awesome conversation. Um, so how is everybody on our panel doing today? Great, great to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited about this. I can't, I'm I've good. been looking forward to this all week. So this is great. Awesome. Yeah, I'm uh, excited well, too. I'm wearing my skull sweater. Nice. <laughs> oh. You're so festive, Phoenix. You're you're like one of the most festive coaches <laughs> I know, actually. Um, so we are getting cued to go ahead and start with the introduction time. Uh, my name is Devin Hunter. I am the author of the Witch Power series. Um, we're taking a look at some of the stuff that we talked about in the Witch's Book of Spirits, um, which will be available in audio by the end of the month. So if you're interested in audiobooks, you should definitely check out the Witch Power series. Um, I am a metaphysical shop owner. Uh, I have been in the industry for about 17 years and a professional psychic medium for almost 20 years. So um, I'm, I'm really glad to be uh, joined uh, or to be joining this panel with some of these really talented uh, witches and psychics. So I'll pass it on. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Phoenix, do you want to go? <laughs> I'll go, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Phoenix Lafay. Uh, I am the author of What is Remembered Lives, uh, which is about working with ancestors, deities, and the Fae. Uh, I also, strangely enough, am a metaphysical shop owner in <laughs> Sebastopol, California. Um, I've been practicing in the pagan tradition, witchcraft tradition, Wicca tradition, whatever label we're going to call it today. Uh, they all work since uh, the mid 90s. I'm one of those mid 90s craft converts. Um, and I love working with the other realms. It is my favorite part about of witchcraft. It's my favorite part about paganism. And I'm really excited to talk about that with these fine panelists today. Check. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go. Um, so I'm Patty Wigington, and um, I've been a practicing witch and pagan since the late 80s or so. So it's been a few minutes. Um, I spent several years as the paganism and Wicca editor on what used to be called about.com. So I did that for a really long time. Um, and I'm also the author of a few really cool books, including this one from Blue Ellen called Badass Ancestors, which came out in September. Um, it is, it's probably the most uniquely personal book that I've ever written. Um, and I'm super excited that I get a chance to be part of not only the kickoff event of the virtual author forum, but I get to hang out with three really cool people whose stuff I've been reading for years. So I'm super excited to be here. Yay. And I guess I'll go last. My name is Danielle Dion yeah. and I am a psychic medium. I'm a witch, I'm an herbalist. Um, I own Moth and Moon Studio, uh, which is a, a spiritual development center in New Hampshire. And I am the author of Magical Mediumship, which is a new book that's coming out. Uh, it hasn't been released yet. It'll be out in December 2020. And I'm really excited to join all of you lovely folks here today. Yay. Sweet. I have to tell you, I, I did just finish your book, uh, Danielle, and it's freaking amazing. So <laughs> oh, thank really you. So I'm really looking forward to that getting out there. For, it, you know, it being your first book out in like the world, girl, you're doing amazing. <laughs> I have to say, that's I'm really, really looking forward to seeing the responses. Oh, so thank congratulations you. on a really amazing first book, Danielle. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So we the question that uh, we're being posed with first uh, is ancestor work is deeply personal and can therefore vary widely from person to person. How do you most often work with your ancestors? And Patty, I think if it's okay, we can start with you. Sure. So for me, ancestor work is, it's not something that I deliberately set out to do. It just kind of evolved organically because of my, my in borderline insane love of genealogy and my obsession with tracing my own family tree, which stems mm -hmm. back actually further than I've been practicing witchcraft. Um, so for me, you know, there's times when I do really focused and really intense ancestor work, but 
I interact with them all the time. My ancestor altar is located right here in my living room. I have to walk past it a dozen times a day. It's always there. Um, it's right by the front door. So, you know, as soon as the mailman comes, I, you know, I'm, I'm making that circuit. Um, so for me, I, I interact with them on a, a sort of a, a, ca a casual level. It's like having a bunch of like really cool dead roommates in my house. Um, so I interact with them that way daily. As far as more um, focused rituals and workings, um, it, usually a couple of times a week, I've got something going on. Sometimes it's something small, like just simply, you know, making an offering and, you know, working on just expression of gratitude. Other times it's a lot more intense and it's like, hey, guys. I need your help and I really need you to work with me on this. And it's a little bit more full, full blown. Um, but for me, it's, it's part of my daily routine. You know, it's just like, you know, blowing my nose or walking to, to the mailbox. It's just something I do. Um, I don't really get up in the morning and think, yeah, today's a good day to work with my ancestors just because they're always here and they're always letting me know that they're here. Um, so I realized that other people work differently, but that's, that's just the way my experience has evolved. And Danielle, how do you most often work with your ancestors? Yeah, so I work in a bunch of different ways. I think there are formal ways and informal ways. Um, I'm a psychic, I forgot to say, I'm a psychic medium. I've been practicing professionally for over a decade. And I've also done a lot in the hospice world and ho uh, hospital settings about helping people transition and having conversations around death. So I think for me, ancestor work kind of spreads the gamut. So yes, it's in a spiritual sense, but it's also in an everyday kind of talking about death and making people more comfortable with the idea that, uh, you know, we will all die and that we have access to the ancestors. So I think much like what Patty was saying, I have an ancestor altar that is, you know, very prominent in my house. Yes, there are formal offerings. Yes, there are formal, uh, you know, sit downs with them to kind of commune and connect in addition to the work that I do with other people. But it's also really informal. So in the morning when I make coffee, you know, I make a pot and I make one a cup for me. I make a cup for the ancestors. I think they're so sympathetic and empathetic to the the world of mortal beings because they once lived. So telling them my struggles, telling them my challenges, telling them my victories, they really I, I feel like they are just deep personal allies. Um, and whether that's as the collective or an individual. I feel like they're on my side. And so it looks different every day. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, for divination purposes, for magical workings, I lean on them. Just like, you know, the idea of family first, and it doesn't have to necessarily be blood family, which I think maybe we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but I lean on them and uh, because they are who I go to first for many, many things. And that has deeply enriched my life. And I am so, uh, you know, continually blessed at the uh, responses and intercession I get from them. Yeah, that's beautiful. And Phoenix, do you feel like your work is more on that personal side? Is it more elaborate? What is your practice with your ancestors look like? I, yeah, I think it's a little of both. I, I really identify with what's already been said. I, I, the ancestor altar definitely looms large in our house as well. But I feel, um, you know, sometimes I've heard folks say that if they have a really good relationship, with their one of their parents they'll call mom or dad and say like hey I'm in this situation or hey I need help with this or hey what would be your advice uh, and I do that with some of my ancestors some of them I don't even know their names um, tangibly like I don't I can't prove that this name is related to me but I know that this person shows up as an ancestral being in my life and I take my problems and concerns and questions to them uh, so it's uh, it's there is the daily thing that happens that I think, you know, we've already had described right from Danielle and um, Patty, like that seems on board for me too. Uh, but I think that more so it comes up when I need the advice, when I need help, when I don't know what to do with the decision and I just call them up sort of, <laughs> I think that's the easiest way to describe it and say, get their advice. What would you recommend? What would you do? How, how do I get through this mm -hmm. situation? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can absolutely resonate with that myself. My practice with my ancestors is is really ever evolving. I um, am one of those, um, uh, you know, third generation Americans. I don't really know a lot about our ancestry. Um, and the one and what I do know, I got to tell you, I'm not 
really down for hanging out with those people. Like they, I don't resonate with them. Um, I recently found out we had a lot of sexual abuse and things like that way back in the family. And I, I'm not going to be calling on those people. So my work has mm -hmm. really leaned more like my whole craft, I think has leaned more on working with like the mighty dead, uh, working with dead who I feel represent what I want to be in this life and my current life and my current setting. Um, and so my ancestor al altars tend to have, you know, uh, Cunningham is, is on my ancestor altar. Sybil Leak is on my ancestor altar. Those are, are people who I feel really, you know, I can resonate with. So I really lean in on working more on that side of things. Um, whereas, you know, all I really know is my family's like Scottish and Welsh. And that's all I know. So um, it's just kind of one of those those things. We all have these different backgrounds and, and seeing how they all merge together, I think, is a really beautiful thing. Um, so back to Danielle's note about lineage. Um, do your do our ancestors need to be connected to us through a familial lineage or can we choose to work with others on the other side of the veil um, that have preceded us? And that's kind of what we were just talking about. So segue into that, Danielle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, it is lovely to work with your bloodline. Um, and, you know, and I think actually what everybody's talking about when we don't have, when we're asked, when our ancestors are kind of assholes, you know, can we work with them? Should we work with them? I think those are personal, uh, you know, things to lean into. But for me, uh, you know, I've actually had some really wonderful ancestral repair and healing come from looking at patterns repeated in the bloodline. So back to the idea of trauma and even sexual trauma and, and other things, finding an ancestral guide ally that is somewhere in your line that wants to spearhead that with you and doing work can be really beneficial. Not necessarily everybody's cup of tea, but I think it is something that can be beneficial forward and backward and to the present. Um, but I don't think it has to be blood. I think you can certainly have ancestors of adoptive mm -hmm. kin. I think in this life, you know, certainly uh, there are people in my life that are closer family wise that are maybe not blood. And so they make beautiful ancestors and the mighty dead, you know, ancestors of tradition, vocation of the land. Uh, there's so many different types of ancestors that can be worked with that are so enriching and they all feel a little bit different in different ways, but uh, great, you know, places to start or explore if you're just getting into this. It doesn't have to be blood. I would say. And what what about you, Patty? Do you have any ancestors that you work with that aren't of your own blood? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I've been, like I said, I've been tracing my family tree for a really long time and I've found a ton of people that I'm related to, not just by blood, but also they might be cousins or maybe they were related by marriage or maybe we're related by cousin marriage. I mean, it's that kind of family. Um, so there's a lot of people that I connect with that I don't have a specific genetic link to. Um, a great example is my late mother-in-law. Um, she passed away in 2013 and I occasionally get messages from her. One of the th items I use on my altar, I have an altar cloth that is a, a quilt top that she started. Now I'm not a quilter. I will never finish this quilt. It's not going to happen. But it resonates because she hand stitched it. So when I'm working with her and other members of that part of the family, because they're, you know, they're my children's relatives, even if they're not mine biologically. Um, so I work with her and I work with other members of that extended family. There are people on my altar who are my spiritual ancestors. Um, a high priest that I worked with many, many years ago has a spot on my altar. There are a couple, you mentioned Cunningham, David being on your altar. Um, I've got a few of those folks on there. Ray Buckland, is on my altar. Uh, recently, I added Ruth Bader Ginsburg to my altar because she was so inspirational to me. I think I've got a candle and everything with RBG on it. I'm telling you. Um, she was so inspirational to me, you know, as growing up as a woman in the United States. Um, and I think of her as an ancestor of justice. And she's, she's, live in large with the rest of them on my altar. So yes, you absolutely can include these folks as part of sort of your overall beloved dead. And that's, it's, it's worked out. It's never served me wrong so far. So one of the things that I, I keep seeing just pop up in the, in the chat room here is this idea of, well, why, why can't you work with, it, uh, you know, an ancestor if you didn't like them or if you don't resonate with them, why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, and I think that leans to this idea that maybe when we die, we get our heads out of our butts and everything's okay. Or does that not happen when you die? Do you, when you die, are you still the same person? Like, how does that work? Phoenix, I'm going to shift this over to you. With your experiences, are all of our ancestors, once they're no longer in the living, do they just become like glorified ascended masters and everything's okay? Or is there a process and does our work affect their process? Yeah. 
Yeah, excellent question. And you know, so let's let's just be harsh and real for a second. None of us really know. And none of us are going to know until we're dead, right? But my experience tells me that my asshole uncle remains an asshole when he's dead unless some sort of spiritual transformation happens for him. It's totally possible. It's totally possible, but if you have this idea that this terrible ancestor of yours is going to pass away and then all of a sudden like you said Devin be an ascended master and and have their stuff figured out i have found that that's less likely that there is still work to do on the other side for all of us as individuals and those of us who caused a lot of harm have more repair and work to do so as their ancestor if i was personally wounded by that individual by that ancestor it might be really hard for me to want to help them but and there is power that comes from helping our ancestors move on. There is, there's work you can do to help elevate your ancestors. There's work you can do to help he heal some of those rifts. Is that your work? Maybe or maybe not. You don't have to be responsible for healing the person who wronged you in life. But it is something to keep in mind that us in the living world can start the repair process to help those things heal. And really, the only reason I say that is because when we can heal that, it heals something in our lineage. So we're not passing that forward. So it's not going into our descendants, whether those are descendants of blood or love or magic. Right. So. So, yeah, I think it's I don't think that they we automatically are wise wise beyond life once we pass over sadly <laughs> yeah yeah and that's something I, I know that all of us touch on in our books at least touch mm -hmm. on um so if you are interested in more in that if we don't get to that more of this part of the discussion later on today go and check out our books because we're, we're writing about this stuff uh, so to kind of lead into this other thing so what about the idea of our animals our our animal companions who we've had forever um, I know I, you know, one of my real quick stories is I had a dove for years. Her name was Sophia. She was a beautiful, amazing creature sent by, you know, the, the heavens, uh, lovely little soul. And she ended up dying accidentally of a, of an egg thing. It happens. Um, but I still oh. feel Sophia land on my shoulder like once a week. And so I feel like, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily call her an ancestor, um, because she's a different species and all that. But I would definitely say like this, this little dove is still hanging out around, you know, she's still part of that ancestral kind of practice. Um, Danielle, I know you work a lot with animals. That's a big part of, of your experience as a witch. Do you, do you have like a, a spirit animal relationship after they pass away? Totally. And I think I saw somebody uh, mention that their cat has recently passed. So I'm sorry to hear that. Um, but yes. And so I actually have um, the remains from a lot of my animals, like whether they're cremains or, you know, other momentum, you know, uh, collars or whatnot that I will include on my ancestor altar or near my ancestor altar. And I think it is a little bit different than working people wise dead for certain, but you can still feel them. And I actually have a, a cat that I grew up with for 17 years who was just really deeply connected to me. And I will still have dreams about her mm -hmm. when I need support in my life. So I definitely think that they can come and that they do, you know, support us and that we can continue those connections in death. Yeah. And what about you, Patty? Do you have a relationship with the animal world in that way? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because nothing ever prepares you for the loss of a pet. Um, and when they're gone, all of a sudden there's this giant dog or cat shaped hole in your heart. And, it, you know, you'll still hear them tip tapping around the house at night, even though they've been gone. Um, so, yeah, I, I do occasionally have mm -hmm. pet items and mementos on or near my ancestor altar. You know, like Danielle said, I don't, you know, obviously, you know, my my Labrador is not one of my ancestors, but I like to believe that once our animals cross over into wherever their next world is, that our ancestors are interacting with them. You know, I, I have people on my altar that are there because I want my ancestor to protect them in death. Um, and I think that goes both ways with our pets. They can look after our pets that have crossed over and our pets can protect them as well. Um, I had a dog who was fiercely loyal that uh, we had to put down a few years ago. And he was just like, he was the family dog and he loved everybody in the family. And I know that you know, if, if our animals are interacting with our ancestors, he's standing guard with them. And, and I'm okay with that. It's comforting and it's a warm feeling and it makes me, it gives me hope. 
Um, so yeah, you know, if you've got some, our pets are our family and, and we can honor them just as much as we can honor anybody else. So the idea that your, your pet becomes part of your team, your, your, your yeah. team of allies on the other side, that's a real thing. What about you, Phoenix? Do you have anything in that vein with your practice? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I refer to my pet allies as the, my beloved dead, right? So they're not exactly ancestors, but they are part of the team. You said that really well, Devin. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, sometimes the, I have a 17-year-old relationship with a cat, too. So uh, he shows up. I'll see him in the corner of my eye. I'll be like, was that Bear Claw? No, Bear Claw's dead. Of course, it wasn't Bear Claw. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they. I think that, um, you know, there's less of a barrier for animals too to show up because they don't have the human junk the you know that talking self to tell them oh that's not possible so i think the veil is always thinner for the the pet beloveds to come through yeah so we're getting we're people want more stories so let's talk real quick about <laughs> our our own experiences um, especially if there's funny or if something's poignant um, regarding our work with our ancestors, animal or otherwise. Um, I'm going to point to you, Patty, on this one to get us started mm -hmm. here. What are what are what's your favorite story here when it comes to working with with your ancestors? Uh, I actually do have a favorite story about working with my ancestors, and the reason for this is because it's a perfect illustration of how important it is to tr trust your gut instinct um, when you're doing ancestral work. Um, so. I am one of those people where despite what people think about me based upon my appearance, I'm not really a big wine drinker. I'm just not. Okay. Um, and yet every year for the holidays, all of my friends gift me with bottles of wine, which is nice because then whenever anyone comes <laughs> over, I don't have to go to the liquor store. It's great. It'll just pop up in a bottle. Um, so, you know, I had like this collection of wine bottles. Um, and a couple of years ago, someone gifted me a really nice, but uh, like a super nice bottle of wine. It's called Hacienda Monasterio. It is, uh, it's a Spanish red wine and it looked super fancy. So I was kind of like, oh, I'm definitely not going to open that for a while. But I couldn't quite, whenever anyone came over and I was entertaining, I couldn't quite bring myself to open it. I was like, there's something about this wine. I just, I need to save it. And I didn't know why, but I knew I needed to. So fast forward about a year and a half, I'm doing my family tree research and I'm trying to work up, a, do a magical working for a very specific purpose with my ancestors, but none of them were a good fit for it. Like they just weren't. And I was like, I wasn't even going to bother them with it. So I'm doing my family tree research and I discover that my, I don't know, like 34th great grandfather or something crazy like that was a guy named King Ferdinand of Castile. He was later canonized as St. Ferdinand and King Ferdinand was the patron, uh, when he was canonized, became the patron saint of the very thing I needed to do this magical working on. And I was like, oh, okay, I need to work with Ferdinand. And that was when I discovered that Hacienda Monasterio comes from a grape called the Tempranillo. And it is only grown in one place in the world. And that is Castile. Here's your offering, Ferdinand. And I... I, I finally oh I finally opened the bottle uh, and within two weeks I got exactly what I needed and then some. So that random bottle of wine, that hunch that I had that it might be worth hanging on to and that it could be important, trust your gut because chances are good that nothing is random. I love it. I love it. What about you, Danielle? Do you have any exciting stories that are along those lines? Yeah, I'll share a book related one. Um, so many, and I think that's why I love this. I hope my mouth continues to hang open as I do this work, uh, and, it, and it does, and I think that's that's wonderful. So um, I think, you know, it's really vulnerable to write a book. And so I'm, I'm standing with these lovely people who have done such beautiful work that I've really admired. And as I'm gearing up for this new release of the book, um, when I had sort of submitted and go, was going through the process with Llewellyn, uh, I really relied on my ancestors. Is this the right time? You know, this is kind of coming up for me. How do we move forward with this? And uh, I got news of the the uh, that my book was accepted. I was it um it was March twenty seventh, uh, because it was my great my, it was my grandfather's birthday. I was with my family going to the cemetery to do our sort of honoring ritual ritual thing. I was with them also. They got to witness that uh, come in, and I just thought that was such a lovely sign that my grandfather was such an advocate for sharing story and. Uh, was just a highly intelligent man and I just felt like that was just such a lovely gift uh, for this process. So I really resonate and love that story. Lovely. How about you, Phoenix? Yeah, there's always so many fun stories. Um, 
So one of the very first public rituals I ever went to was a Samhain ritual. And we went on a trance to meet an ancestor and my grandfather showed up who I met. I'm the, I'm the oldest of all the cousins. I'm the only grandchild in the family that he actually met in the flesh. And I've always felt a kinship with him even though he passed away when I was two. Uh, and so the whole time we were, I was in this trance in this ritual, we were, he was sharing information with me and I kept hearing bells ringing. And I was like, you know, like little, like little jingle bell noises. And I thought that's really weird. I don't get it. When I questioned in the trance process, I questioned my grandfather about it. And he just kind of smiled at me and he said, ask your mother. So many weeks later, I asked my mom and she says, that's so weird. You bring it up. And she brings out this little tiny bell. And apparently my grandfather, army man through and through, he would ring the bell when he wanted his kids to fetch him something. So he would ring this bell and call my mom's name and be like, "Get, fetch me a beer, fetch me a coffee, fetch me something to eat. And uh, so she gave me this bell. So now it's on my ancestor altar. And anytime I hear a little jingle like that, I'm like, okay, I'll, I'm, I'm fetching you something. I'll get you some beer. It's usually beer. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. 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 I am. Um... I have, so as most of you guys will probably get this. So being who we are doing, writing the books and, and seeing clients and going through this whole process where, you know, working with the dead is a pretty normal part of your day. It's really easy to kind of overthink things or think things to a place of rationale where you just look at everything. You're like, oh, okay, that's just my mind. I know mm. what's going on. And, I'm, and I tend to be more left brain when it comes to my, the way I process my occult experiences. Um, so, you know, after, I want to say it was about 12 years of doing the professional mediumship thing, I hadn't had anybody I was close to pass away, um, at, you know, up until, up until a couple of years ago. And I was really in a place of, of being kind of confronted with my, the reality that people do die, right? And people die every day. And this is part of the natural order of existence, right? And, um, and so my, uh, my grandfather had passed away and I was in Ohio and I live in California now. We don't get snow. It's not a thing. Um, and I, so he had passed away and I was there and it just happened to be work out great where I could be there to help with the funeral stuff and then deal with the family stuff. I hadn't felt him around me and my grandfather and I were really close. Um, and I hadn't felt him around me. I hadn't, I, you know, I was just focused on everyone else's grief and what they were kind of processing, what they were going through and trying to be a good grandkid and help with the funeral arrangements and all of that stuff. And during this whole time, I, I still wasn't feeling him around. I wasn't feeling any spiritual juju. And I'm in, and in my head, I'm going, this is what I do for a living. Like, how could I not feel my own grandfather yeah. next to me? And how could I not feel him around? So it's going through this really difficult, almost existential crisis that this was causing while I'm going through the process of, of helping my family with the, the funeral arrangements. And I get in my car after we after we've done the whole thing. And I was really lucky to have just you know about five minutes alone with him, where it's just me and me and his body, and and I got to say goodbye and give him a kiss. And as I, you know, I'm doing the whole manly thing, gotta not cry in front of the family, because if I start crying, everyone's gonna start crying, do that whole thing. So I get out of the car, I get out of the building and I, I sit down in my car. And as soon as I sit down, it's not within two minutes of me crying, the sky just gets really dark and it just starts snowing. And it was the first time I had seen snow in 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that was, a, a, he and I were big wow. snow people. We'd go make snow angels and we'd go make snowmen and you know all of this stuff. So, it, and I had just said well, while I was there, I really hope I get to see snow this time. I really hope that, you mm -hmm. know. And so that was, I'm sitting in the car, I'm just tears are pouring down my eyes, trying to collect myself and I open up and then it's just snow is everywhere. And it was, it was like one of those touched by an angel kind of moments, you know, where you're like, oh, mm -hmm. This is all real, and I'm <laughs> yeah. not just convincing myself because it's convenient. You know, it was a really, really beautiful thing. But it, you know, when we when we lose someone who's close to us, it's a really difficult thing to process. Do you mm -hmm. feel that the people who you're close to are more likely to be around when they go away, or when they cross over, they pass on, or do you feel like it's easier to access the ancestors that are kind of later on down the road? Danielle, what about you? Yeah, I think I have experienced similar things where it's frustrating, especially if everybody in your family knows you're a medium. And oh, you know, so-and-so's dead. Why can't you just talk to them? You know, ring them up. What the heck? 
And uh, I think we are mortal beings and we have to go through our grieving process. I do think there's a transition that happens when we go to spirit. And so it's not that an instantaneous, immediate, you know, um, connection that maybe we really want or even, you know, uh, feel like we should have if we are doing this work in the world. We still have to honor our own tides and our own processes. And I do think that, you know, when the time is right, I had somebody very significant cross a few years ago and uh, it was really frustrating. I really wanted to hear from them. And it took almost a year to really start to integrate and feel them and have them come around uh, more in the way that, you know, when they, you know, when we assume that they go collectively, when they go into the, you know, um, ancestral collective. So it takes different amounts of time. I think there's interesting things that we can look at. I read about that in my book. I'm sure everybody also plays with that too. Um, but yeah, I think we shouldn't beat ourselves up. Or if you're in that position, anybody out there, uh, know that it takes time and it, it kind of is individual in a lot of ways. So um, honor your grieving process and they'll come uh, when it's when it's the right time and when you're open to it too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Patty, one of the things that I really enjoyed about your book was that you, you give us these ways of bringing the power of our ancestors and the badass stuff that they did into mm -hmm. our lives on a daily, like basis where you can feel them. Do you feel that the work that you talk about in your book is something that like everybody's going to be capable of doing? Or is there, do we have to feel what death is before we understand how to access this energy? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because all of a sudden this year, like in the middle of a global pandemic, all of a sudden there's all these books about ancestor work just popping up. And I'm sure like me, most of you guys wrote these books last year. Like I never sat down and thought, well, there's going to be a pandemic next year. I should write a book about working with the dead, you know, so it just, you know, it's one of those <laughs> things where, you know, so now all of a sudden people are picking up on it. But Ancestor veneration, ancestor work isn't anything new. I mean, people have been doing it as long as recorded history. So I think what happens is, you know, there are some people who are like, oh, that sounds really complicated. I don't even know if I can. But the thing is, I always tell people, ancestor work might not be for everybody, but it is for anybody. And and by that, I mean, it's open to you. It, ancestor work doesn't care about the color of your skin, about your religious background, about where your people lived before they came to somewhere else. Um, because if you're interested in putting forth the effort, and like any other sort of magical practice, I mean, it does require some work. You, you, you get out what you put into it. Um, but it's something that anybody can do. And it's, you know, there's, you do have to open yourself up. You have to be willing to listen. You have to be willing to say, am I really talking to my dead great grandmother or am I crazy? And, you know, and then figure out what the correct answer is. Um, I'm sure like me, most of you guys had your, your first I see dead people experience fairly young and you do sort of question it. And I think a lot of people are raised to question that because we live in a society where people are taught not to believe in that stuff. Um, but for people like us and for all the folks who are tuning in right now, whether they're new to it or whether they're veterans at working with spirit or their dead or their guides or their ancestors, it's something that anyone can do. Um, but you, you do get out what you put into it. And the more you put into it, the more enriching and powerful your experience is going to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Phoenix, you brought up um, your ancestor experience happened around Samhain. Uh, to that end, do you feel our ancestor workings are more powerful at that time of the year or why or why not? Like, what are your thoughts on, on timing when it comes to this stuff? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. And I think I've changed my opinion about that. Um, as I get older, as I, my practice has shifted and changed, you know, I was greatly influenced by sort of, I guess I'm going to call it mainstream Wicca when I first started practicing. And so kind of living by this wheel of the year and understanding the veil being thinner at Samhain, that greatly influenced my practice. So I made space for ancestor work at this time of the year, you know, from from the fall equinox to winter solstice, really. It felt like there was it was more palpable. But I, I don't know that I follow that guideline anymore. And it, maybe it's just because I do ancestor work more often. Maybe it's just because now that I've opened the door, they keep coming through <laughs> or or I don't I don't know. But uh, I think it, they're there all the time. There is something sweet and special about Samhain because it is this universal moment where 
you know, my partner and I were just talking about this yesterday. You can be a public witch and no one will look at you funny. They'll be like, oh, it's Halloween. And so it's not a, it's not weird like it might be at other times of the year. So there is something about that that resonance that makes it easier, smoother. I don't know, but um, but they're there all the time. They're totally there all the time. Yeah, there's a, a question in the in the chat room about the idea of, you know, are, where do the ancestors go? Is it is this like another world? Do they live like we talk about the underworld? We talk about you know the summer lens. Um, what is that? In my experience, I, and then I'm going to pass it on because I want to hear everybody's thoughts on this because not all occultists agree on this. Um, but you know, in my experience, I, I think the mind is a very powerful thing. And I think that our mind is tuning in and out of what I refer to as psychic frequencies. Um, mm -hmm. And those psychic frequencies happen to be dead people, you know? And so I, I don't, and from where I look at it, I think when I, when I journey shamanically or shamanically to meet somebody or to meet ancestors, that tends to be me going out of my body to another place. Um, but as a medium, I feel like they're coming to me and my place. So I'm mm -hmm. gonna pass that on mm -hmm. to you, Patty. What are your thoughts on that? Where where do the ancestors go? Where do they live? It, it's, it's one of life's great mysteries. You know, they say death is the next big adventure and who knows, I mean, my ancestors are probably like hanging out at Ikea or something like that. Um, but you know, the, the, the thing is there's, there's the expression, what is remembered lives. And I truly believe, and I always tell people, you know, as long as you can hold someone in here and they're in here, they're never really gone. Um, and I do think when you go into that trance state or when you're in that meditative state and you're working with your people, um, you know, they're, they're, they're right here. We might not be able to see them, but I, you know, I, it's one of those questions I struggle with on a regular basis. You know, is it a summer land? Is it like Valhalla? Do people's different ancestors go to different places depending on their cultural background? Um, it's a mystery to me. All I know for sure is that despite every bit of logic and reason telling me that this is all in my head, I know for a fact that they're here because I've worked with them. I've experienced them. I have felt them standing behind me. I've felt their hands on my shoulder. Um, and I know that they're with me and all I can do is wait to see what happens when I get there at this point. And I, I know that's kind of a non-committal answer, but you're right. All occultists don't agree. And my answer is, I don't know. Where did they go? All I know is they're here. Yeah. Uh, so, Danielle, I'm going to direct that to you. Where, what do you think is happening here? And, and, and you know, what I'm and really I think what we're trying to do is here is we're all just grasping at answers and we're trying to be inspired so we can understand what's going on. So what do you think is happening as a, you know, somebody who's a professional medium and you do this work, you know, so intensely for the public? Like, what is it? What is what do you think is going on? Yeah, I kind of agree with both uh, what Patty and you have said, Devin, where I think doing the mediumship, they are coming to you. So we're sitting there, we're inviting, we're holding space, and that it is sort of them coming to you and being able to connect. But I also think that we can go to them. And I think there are different landscapes. I think there are different, you know, at least in my experiences, when we do interact, it's not, you know, exactly one, um, I don't envision it as one specific place. Uh, so I think all of these things are possible, um, but I do think there is something different about going to them versus having them come to you. And I also wonder too about what really happens to the soul when we die. You know, uh, I think that that is a really fascinating thing and, and a model that I kind of like to look at in my practice about what aspect of the dead are we connecting when we, when we do ancestral work, when we do mediumship or doing graveyard work. I think there are a lot of different ways to look at the dead. I can't say for certain that, you know, what I believe in today and what I work with today will be my final answer in 10 years and 15 years. I think it's shifted over time. Um, but coming from a, a background in spiritualism and witchcraft and different, you know, uh, and, and shamanic trainings and things, uh, I think get, gaining a bigger context into what the possibilities are help us to interface when we come to whatever, uh, you know, connection point we have in our practice. So for me, it's kind of evolving, but I think there's lots of different ways to, uh, you know, connect with them and, and it changes and it's, you know, different in, in different veins. Yeah. That makes sense. So Phoenix, I'm going to pose a different yeah. question to you. Um, and and the, because I, I it kind of hits on what you were talking about before. So uh, there's a question in the chat room about what about ancestors who were babies, children or mentally disabled? Can we have a meaningful interaction with these ancestors? And what does that look like? Um, and the question was, do we have any experience with that? Um, so I know I've got I have many opinions, but I want to know, Phoenix, can we have a relationship with, you know, those types of dead? 
Yeah, so um, I, I think you can. And I think it depends on the energy of that specific debt and that spirit, right? Um, I, this is not my personal experience, but I do have a, a dear friend who lost a pregnancy. Uh, and she works with that beloved dead. She communicates with that child spirit. She has a beautiful relationship. Sorry, my cat is about to attack. <laughs> um, and they, th it is a huge part of her spiritual working is being connected to this, this baby spirit. So yeah, I think it's absolutely possible. I just think that not all, um, not all of those spirits are going to be as evolved, right? So they are they recycled into the collective and there is wisdom there or were they really a brand new spirit that doesn't have a lot of um, experience? You know, it could be all of the above. So um, it's possible that you just have to reach out and practice. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Patty? Do you think when we're working with, um, you know, people or our ancestors who didn't get a chance to thrive in the way that we've had a chance to thrive, what are the benefits and of working with that energy, and, and what what does that mean for us as occultists? Yeah, I absolutely think that that's something that you can do. And and whenever I do my ancestor workshops, I always tell people if you are someone who has experienced the the trauma and the pain of losing a child, um, you can. You know, from a genealogical perspective, that person would be your descendant rather than your ancestor. But we're not talking about genealogy. We're not talking about like making charts. We're talking about somebody that you loved and lost. Um, and it is absolutely appropriate, in my opinion, to include that child on your ancestor altar because the rest of your people are going to surround that child and they're going to watch over them and they're going to protect them until it's your turn to join them. Um, same with if you have somebody who had a, a mental or cognitive disability. Uh, my grandfather had a close family member that he, a cousin who was raised in his home, uh, who was a young woman who died fairly young in her twenties and she had been institutionalized. Um, and I, I knew her name. I'd never heard much more about her, but I knew who she was. And she occasionally will pop in as I'm doing work with other members of that branch of the family. Um, and I think she's lonely and I think she needs to feel comforted and safe and warm and loved and what better place than with me and the rest of my kinfolk. So yes, absolutely appropriate to include people who might not be ancestors, but that you've still lost anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Danielle, what do you think the ancestors are getting out of working with us? Like, why would the ancestors like stop their afterlife <laughs> and come and worry about us? Like, why, what do they get out of that? Yeah, I think uh, we've talked a little bit about, I think working with them, we can help elevate them in some regards, but I think that they care about us because they were like us. Uh, you know, just because, you know, your loved one dies doesn't mean they're going to stop loving you. So I think that they empathize with our struggles and they want to come forward and they want to see, see us succeed. Um, I think that, you know, just like, you know, if your ancestors tell you to do something, you still have free will and free choice in that matter. Um, but for the most part, they do want us to succeed and go on. So I think they care about what happens to us. I think that's one of the reasons that they intercess. And I think at the same time, um, kind of going back to the idea of some of our ancestors who are not always the best people, sometimes they show up. And if we do take on that mantle, can be really powerful healing in the family. I had a really powerful experience with somebody who was incarcerated in our family, who did really terrible, horrible things um, that maybe in life I wouldn't want to have been associated with. And I, and I was very little in the family, um, but has turned into a wonderful protection ally and ancestor. And I think through our partnership, I've seen and felt their evolution in some ways. Um, and so I do think that that has been beneficial to them as well. So I think it's a two-way street. I think it's a partnership. It's reciprocal in the energy that, you know, you're putting in and receiving back. But I think we can both benefit from it. And I think that's why they show up. Yeah. I'm one of those witches who believes in an that ancestors exist, but also in reincarnation. And so, um, and I, mm -hmm. I think that when we do the work of, of what you were just talking about, right? Of, of bringing them in, giving them opportunities to correct the pattern that they maybe started or created in their life and 
how that has affected us. And I feel that when I have done that in my past, that it's been a really healing experience, not just for what I feel like is happening for them and for the family, but for me as well, you know? And when we think about that idea of reincarnation, it's, it's this Eastern idea that's been Westernized, at least the way that we often talk about it. And so we kind of get removed from this idea of, of you know, originally the, the concepts of karma and all of those things had a lot to do with this idea that you're stuck in this cycle of reincarnation and you got to do work to get out of it, right? And so for those of us who walk that line where reincarnation is a thing, but yet we're still talking to these ancestors, it's it this becomes a really hot topic, right? Like, are you making it all up? Is this, you know, what's going on? And in my experience, what I, what I believe is happening is that there are, you know, kind of layers to the soul. And as we're processing those layers peel back, some aspects of our personality and our life drop off. Some things are always going to be there and, you know, they're never going to change. So when I am connecting to the, you know, the, the spirit of what I believe is Sybil Leak, I don't think I'm actually having a conversation with Sybil Leak from, you know, the, the 50s and the 60s. I believe I'm having a conversation with, you know, what was left over, right, after, after her process, after all the stuff that she's done. But again, this is one of those things that not all occultists agree on. So I'm going to shift it over to you, Patty. What do you think about <laughs> reincarnation, the idea of reincarnation and ancestors? How do those things fit together? Yeah, you know, I think the soul and the spirit are very complex and they're multi-layered. They're not, it's not like pie. There's not like a finite amount of pieces. And once everybody's got their slice, then that's it. Um, you know, we, it's, it's entirely possible to work with an ancestor on a spiritual level who may have also been reincarnated. It's also possible that multiple people are working with that ancestor. Why do we see Abraham Lincoln ghosts in like a dozen different places around the country? Because, you know, there's, there's more to a, a spirit or soul than just that one thing, that one single vessel. Um, so yeah, I think it's absolutely possible that, you know, I, I have a dear friend who's, granddaughter was born nine months to the day after her mother passed away. And this child exhibits all of the same personality traits of her deceased grandmother. But my friend also works with her late mother on an ancestral level. So they can be in multiple places. Um, so I don't think, you know, it, it's, we have no hard evidence. We have no, you know, studies. We have no metrics. We have no hard facts. All we know is what we've experienced. Um, and sometimes that has to be enough. And as, as Danielle mentioned earlier, you know, our, our practices and our philosophies and our ideas change and evolve. Um, and, you know, the person I am now is certainly not the same person who was practicing 20 years ago. Um, all I know is what I've experienced. And I think, yes, we our, our people can be in many places or they can choose to be in none at all. So, yeah. And, and Phoenix, yeah. what about you? What, how do you feel about this? I, one of the things that I, I really do appreciate about your practice is that you have very um, animistic, very shamanistic, in my view, you know, kind of approach to this. And so I really appreciate your viewpoint. What do you think is happening with, with this? Yeah, you know, I agree a lot with how you talked about things, Devin. I think that we're kind of on the same basis with that. But I also just feel like it's important to name that this is ancestral, right? Like the, the DNA, the blood, the bone, the skin that I carry came from a lineage of ancestors. So I can access them because of the body I possess. I can access them because of the hair color I have and the eye color I have. Uh, weirdly, I have all the recessive traits in my family line. You know, the fact that um, the, the size of my feet and the uh, the fact that I freckle, like all of these things come from my blood, my, my DNA. And so there is a way that you can connect to your ancestors through that, through your physical body, because they, they made it. Yeah. Yeah, I like to think of, uh, oh, we're going to have to wrap up here, but I like to think of um, ancestors and the work that we do is kind of like a forest, you know, the forest yeah. starts at one place and then it grows outward. It isn't a direct line. It's this, this kind of circular totally. motion outward. And we are just the newest sprigs that are, you know, sprouting out at the edge of the forest. But if you go deeper into that forest, the, the, the stuff is there, right? The, the, the magic is there, the stuff that was originally there that we've been passed on, all of that DNA, all of that wisdom from the primordial existence, it's all there and it passes on to us. So we do have to wrap up. Um, so thank you to everybody real quick. Um, 
where can we find you? We got like 30 seconds. Patty, where would you send people? Pattywigington.com or facebook.com backslash about paganism. Find All me. Right. <laughs> How about you, Danielle? Where can we send people? Uh, DanielleDion.com or mothandmoonstudio.com. Thank you so much. Beautiful. And Phoenix? Yeah, phoenixlefay.com or milk-and-honey.com. Awesome. Uh, and you can find me at modernwitch.com. You can also go to witchessabbat.com where we have uh, a brand new event that's online. It's really amazing. Lots of Llewellyn authors are going to be there. And we're doing the first witchies, which is the very first, uh, very first award ceremony for occultist in the uh, marketing uh, the content creation stuff. I'm getting losing my mind as we're, we're leaving here. But thank you everybody for tuning in <laughs> uh, from all of us at Llewellyn. Stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands, and we love you so much. We hope that you will join us for our next event. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.